Let's do it. Sunday night football. Aaron Rodgers and the Packers taking on the Chiefs in Arrowhead. No Pat Mahomes, but it would still be a tighter contest than we imagined. Early in the first quarter, Packers up 7-0. Someone find Aaron Jones, Dan. Love the usage of Jones. Split him out as a wide receiver. Kind of a stem double move by him. Great throw by Rodgers. Wasn't, in fact, a touchdown. He didn't tightrope it well, but they did score later in the drive. Second quarter we go. Watch Travis Kelsey sell this, Dan. I don't even know how to describe this play. A little bit of emotion, fake shovel pass. Kelsey turns one way. The throw turns him another way. Incredible athleticism and then post touchdown dance. Jump on it. Jump on it. Pat Mahomes loves it as well. Under seven minutes and a half. Chiefs with the ball at the Packers 30. Great downfield blocking here. And this is the Chiefs when they're at their best. Speed. McCole Hartman on the edge. They arc release both tight ends, meaning they're going outside. He does an outstanding job of waiting for those blocks. Touchdown. And probably the Chiefs take a lead into the half. Fourth quarter we go. I'm sorry, this is being described as many things. It looks like he was throwing the ball away to me. He wasn't. <laughs> uh, they, they, wow! Yeah, I mean, what is this? Let the play speak for itself. Absolutely yeah. incredible. This is the second week in a row we've seen a throw like this by Rodgers. There has been some reaction. You'll hear it. Many arguing it's the greatest throw of all time, Coach. I'm just saying. Many meaning Woo. Pat McAfee. <laughs> I mean, listen, the balance, <laughs> falling away off one leg, Crazy throwing it to draw. a place where only his guy can go get it. Very nonchalant for a Hall of Famer. On purpose. On purpose. Okay, all right. Uh, and then lastly, again, Aaron Jones, little screen here. Rodgers would say, we caught lightning in a bottle with him twice. He runs it in untouched. Jones, first Packers running back with 150 receiving yards since the NFL merger in 1970. But let's be real about that pass to Williams. I mean, what? That was one of the best, if not the best, pass I've ever seen live in person. I, that was incredible. I couldn't believe it. It was just one of those plays that kind of leaves you speechless. I saw the ball in there, and uh, I was like, that's a little high. And then I look back, and, you know, I mean, I mean, that's just, that's just who he is. You know, he's special, and... It's 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 moments like that that make him that make him to go. It really does. I was actually throwing a, a ball that uh, I thought maybe Jimmy could go up and get if he wanted to, and if he didn't, the guy behind him might be able to get. Um, luckily, the guy behind him got it. I love that. Had a backup plan. <laughs> it was intended the entire way. Uh, 31 points. They hang on a solid Chiefs defense. They are the highest scoring offense since week four are the Packers. Dan, what's clicking specifically for them? Well, I love the fact that they've started to use Aaron Jones in the way that we've seen the Rams use Todd Gurley. Aaron Jones has become Matt LaFleur's Todd Gurley in all the different ways that they use him. They'll put him out and toss it to him from a perimeter run game standpoint. They'll motion him out of the backfield and throw the football to him down the field because he's such a good receiver and can track the football and you have the ability to get matchups on linebackers down the field that way and then they'll use him in their um, kind of screen game where you'll put him out as a wide receiver, motion him in and then you get him out in space and that equates to big plays. The Rams have done this for years with Todd Gurley. Matt LaFleur has his historical ties with the Rams. I love the fact that they're using Aaron Jones in that regard. Does anybody think it's funny? Last year, this guy was on the bench because he, he wasn't a good receiver. Really? Mm. Maybe we see why there's a new coach over there. Because when <laughs> you look at this, I mean, this guy is phenomenal in the passing game. I mean, he's always had this talent. I mean, he averaged almost six yards a carry last year. I mean, the guy has always had phenomenal talent. But LaFleur, like, he, I, I got to tip my hat to him because he is doing a great job. And when you mentioned the Todd Gurley thing, I'm like, Wow, that you know what? You're exactly right on that. But I look at it this way. LaFleur talked about that's the greatest throw he's ever seen. Uh -huh. What is he like, 20 years old? No wonder it's the greatest <laughs> throw that he's with, ever done. It. Which, I, I was with Matt LaFleur for two years. So how am I supposed to take that? Well, uh, I think exactly how you should young take guys. it. Yeah. How it was intended. Exactly how you should take it. This Packers team, and I wish I had a little bit of extendo on my arm to pat myself on my back. I've been saying this team's going to be in the Super Bowl for a long – thank you, Rex. That yep. really means a lot. Good teams win, great teams cover. Not easy to do at the home <laughs> of the Chiefs. But the reason why is this Packers team has a complete team around Aaron Rodgers. Uh, the Packers and the Patriots are the only team that have efficiency on top ten on the offense and defensive sides of the ball. Aaron Aaron Jones accounted for 60% of the offense yesterday. Aaron Rodgers has not had a guy like that in the backfield ever. This is a team that is very good. And with Aaron Rodgers and LaFleur kind of gelling together. You see they're coming together full sync. You're watching it week in, week out. And last night, third and five to win the game. LaFleur literally looks at Aaron Rodgers and says, 
hey, let's go win the game. And that is a moment that Aaron Rodgers, who was on the outs with McCarthy for a while, having a head coach that believes in him, and Aaron Rodgers believes in LaFleur, little five yard out to seal it, let's take a knee and win this thing. Big time win for the Packers on the road. Whether or not Matt Moore was great or not, which he was, I think Adrian did well, big win for the Packers, and they covered, which is good for uh, me. <laughs> Specifically. <laughs> so that's how our NFL Sunday came to an end. Meanwhile, the game before that was the one a lot of eyeballs were on, and it was a pouring, rainy day in Foxborough. It was Bill Belichick was seeking his 300th win, including playoffs as coach of the Patriots, taking on the Browns. Coming off a bye were the Browns. Bear that in mind. They had an extra week of preparation. The Patriots on a short week, mm. but early. Nick Chubb, we've got ourselves a problem, and it's a scoop and score. Yeah, listen, this is a BBB. Bad break, bro. Unbelievable that the... Ooh. The heel, the, Browns in there. the heel of the defender pops that ball out for a touchdown, New England. All right, so that's the fourth Patriots defensive touchdown of the season. This is the next Cleveland offensive play, and it's Chubb again. And you're feeling good in the middle of this play. You're like, okay, great. Here comes our run game. Chubb may score here. And then an incredible job by Jonathan Jones seeing that football coming over the top and punching it out. So that's two straight plays with a turnover. Now here's, after a Patriot punt, maybe the worst play of the NFL season. Can I say, can I say BBB again? Like, listen, as a quarterback, you're thinking, I'm just tossing this to Jarvis Landry. I'm not thinking that guy, the literally guy, is going to be right in between the toss and me and intercept it. That guy is Lawrence Guy. Patriots a 17-7 lead at halftime. Third quarter, it's a seven-point game. Tom Brady, Julian Edelman, two touchdowns on the day. Heard this before. Great patience by Brady against the three-man rush. Finding some time, and then Edelman finding space. Touchdown, New England. And then a very curious sequence at the end here. You see the Browns are down 17 points on fourth and 11. They're going to punt. They're called for a false start. They're backed up five yards. Now it's fourth and 16, and Freddie Kitchens decides, I'm sending my offense back out on the field, and we're going for it. As everybody would do, Greeny, it's much easier <laughs> to convert fourth and 16 compared to fourth and 11. I, this is horrendous. How the hell does this happen? They were going to lose anyway. Bill Belichick, his 300th win, gets a game ball. Let's talk. It's a great um, privilege to, to coach this team and to coach the guys that I've coached throughout my career. Um, fortunately, I didn't play in any of those games. That's a good thing for us. Uh, but I've had a lot of good players, a lot of great players. And, you know, they're the ones that win the games. Just proud of him, everything he's accomplished. And, uh, you know, amazing to think that he coached for another place and they didn't think he was good enough. You know, and then he comes here and uh, does a great job. Jab, jab. Maybe <laughs> Cleveland should have kept him. Ooh. I'm just saying maybe. If you think it's a coincidence, he's saying that when they beat Cleveland, which Hello. is the team that fired Belichick, then, then obviously that's not either. Okay, Rex, obviously of those 300 Ooh. wins, about half of them, of them were against you. A bunch uh, of them were. There's no doubt. What, it only feels like all 300 were We're, we're going to talk a lot about the Brown side of this in a minute because I think that's the more interesting side of it. As far as Belichick is concerned, what can you say? It's 300 wins. It's Shula, yeah. it's Hallis, and it's Belichick. He's the best of all time, and mm -hmm. there's no doubt about it. And to me, it's it's the little things. It's the consistency. Every week is a completely different game plan. You know, so it's like he's there every week. And for 300 wins, I mean, this is, look, I don't care if he doesn't win another game. He's still the greatest coach of all time. And and you knew as, as a coach going up against him, you better darn well be at your very best or you were going to get embarrassed like the Browns did yesterday. And Pat, I want you to make the point that you did in our meeting this morning that I think is interesting. To be doing it over this period of time with the way people have changed and yeah. players have changed. Yeah, I think a lot of people don't think about the humans that are players. I mean, this millennial generation is much different than it was back in the day. And Belichick has not only been able to adapt his game plans week in and week out, but his coaching styles to reach different generations of players. you got Tom Brady, who is the living legend, the greatest of all time. Then you got young guys like Dorsett going in there. Very different. And coaching is bringing the best out of people and his ability to do that with different generations for two decades now of greatness in New England is something that should be noted and talked about because it's not easy to do. All right, so we have that side of Patriots win. They're unbeaten. Their defense has almost outscored the points that they've allowed all season. So they're remarkable. The Browns off a of bye week, sloppy penalties, mm. turnovers, trouble. They're two and five. Let's hear from them. Dink. We fought hard. It's not like a patting us on the back, but we fought hard. But there's no, there is no pat on the back. Um, we lost the game. That's not what we came here to do. Um, and if we don't correct these mistakes, we're going to be the, the if team or coulda, woulda, um, all, those, all those things. So it has to get corrected. Dan, where do we begin? Huh. The same storyline that we've said for the Browns basically every week. 
You know, yesterday's a perfect example of there's talent on this football team and there's moments that they look good, but they're not a good football team. And it was, again, penalties and turnovers. Listen, they weren't going to win the game. I get that. But the third and 11 to fourth and 11 (laughs) to fourth and 16 totally encapsulates their football season, right? Because when you go for it on third and 11 here, your job as a coach in this moment, once you make your play call, you're automatically having the conversation, okay, if we don't get this, what is our plan, guys? Do we need to go for this with where the game is? Then you send the punt unit out there on fourth and 11, realize, wow, we have to go for this. And instead of using your timeout, you take a penalty on purpose because you think it's going to be easier to get those five yards (laughs) instead of using that timeout. And it totally reeks of unprepared football team, unprepared coaching. When you make your third down play call, it's easy. You're on the phone with your headset. Guys, if we get five yards here, are we going for it? What happens if if this ball is incomplete? Are we going for it? And the lack of preparation, it's the storyline for the Browns. Dan, here's what you do in coaching. In that situation, it wasn't just on third down. As you get it, you're going to get the possession. You're like, okay, guys, we're four down territory the rest yeah. of the game. Mm-hmm. Before the you rest even step first game. down. So, you, I mean, that's, that's already – you've already told them that. Whether you're calling the plays or not, you've already mentioned it to them. Hey, guys, we got no choice. We're in four down the rest of the game. But that play, Period. like that sequence totally encapsulates the Browns being <laughs> – unprepared all year. Well, I would argue that the three turnovers in consecutive plays could potentially encapsulate their season. <laughs> <Anyways, laughs> uh, Nick Chubb got a fumble from a donkey kick from his own offensive lineman. I mean, that is a tough scenario, tough situation. Also, everything that falls on the coaching desk, I mean, head coach, everything runs from the top down. They are the most penalized team in documented history of the NFL. I mean, that is just yep. a, a factual statement. So not only did they come off the bye week, three turnovers in the first quarter against a team you can't turn over the ball against, not only are they still the most penalized team, then they have the, if we're going to pick up 11, we can pick up 16 debacle at the end. It seems like things, well, this might be a little cliche, might be getting a little hot in the kitchens. Uh, for Ooh. Freddie Kitchens, especially with the underperformance of this team. They're like the Titanic. Everybody thought they are unsinkable. They've crashed into every single iceberg you could potentially find. And if they're going to let Freddie Kitchens play the music all the way down to the bottom of the ocean while Jack and Rose are floating on that damn board, that's a bad decision for the dog. <laughs> I'll never let go. I mean, Coach, but in particular, when she you, did let when go. You, she did, in fact, let go. She yeah. lied. Um, but with the talent that he has on that roster, I understand games yeah. that won on paper, but when you look from top to bottom, they're a very talented team, and they're 2-5. and five. Yeah, you would kill for this talent. And it's so funny how we make excuses for him. You know, first week, hey, that's just the first week, all these penalties. Mm-hmm. Well, it hadn't gotten better. And then you're sitting back going, uh, you know, every, every week it's something else that happens. Well, as a coach, guess what? I would kill for this talent. Any coach in the league would kill for this talent. You might be the most talented team you know, in the National Football League, and you're two and five. So who's going to get the, uh, you know, who's going down? I promise you he's going down. Because uh, they're not going to fire the players. They're going to fire the coach. Here's the only thing I'll tell you guys. Bingo. This is the schedule coming up here. Ooh. There's some winnable games on that schedule. The Browns in a division that has not fully run away from them yet are not dead. They're in trouble. They're on that little float thing that with Jack and Rose, but they haven't gotten to the bottom <laughs> quite the yet. The door. Meanwhile. <laughs> I told you on the day of the sports equinox, it was this man who stole the show. Final round of the Zozo Championship, otherwise known when Tiger was playing as the fifth major. He opened the day with a 12th hole with a three-stroke lead, just needed to take it to the house, and that he did. That's his third shot on 18, a par Mm. five. He only needs to three-putt to win the tournament. But if you're Tiger Woods, you don't need three putts. Knock it in for a bird and his 82nd career PGA Tour win that as they raise the flag, it ties Sam Snead for the most all time. Tiger Woods has now won as many golf tournaments as anyone who ever lived. There are a lot of ways to contextualize this There's win for work. Tiger Woods. Let's hear there's a point where I, I didn't know if I'd ever play again. Uh, I was just hoping to be able to walk normal again. And so to be able to go through all that, to get to where I'm at now, is uh, very, very. I'm very appreciative. Of, I know how how it feels to have um, this game, you know, what I felt like it's taken away from me, where I, I couldn't participate in the way that I wanted to. And uh, I'm just so happy and so fortunate to be able to have this opportunity again. 
I think I speak for all of us when I say we're happy too. Yeah. 82 wins. Here's the best way to put that in perspective. Those are the top 10 ranked players in the world. Combined, they've won 81 <laughs> events. Tiger Woods has won 82. Let's get it. As we continue here on this morning of Get Up, the Bears came into the season a stylish Super Bowl.